and came from Rice University as an anthropologist studying climate science. And so her work for a long time has spanned the um, Span the arena of how does society interpret science and how are scientists understood by society. Her PhD is from Rice University. She's um, really a citizen of the world in the sense that she um, did a, her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan in the state. She and um, her high school education was in France. Her um, undergraduate, her, I'm sorry, her elementary school was in uh, Denmark, where she's a, a native. And now she, as I mentioned, um, works in Brazil. She's been um, in the Brazilian regional office of the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. She was um, a postdoc at Harvard at the Kennedy School in the Environmental Science and Public Policy Program and then went on to be a lecturer there. Um, she was also a postdoc at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. She's an executive editor of the Environment um, Science and Policy for Sustainable Development Journal and an executive editor for uh, the Social Status of Climate Change Knowledge, um, Wires Climate Change. And she's also a social science advisor to Nature Climate Change since its inception in 2010. Really glad to have you here. We look forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I really want to thank the Step Center, Denise and Charles for having made this very easy. And I'm very happy to be here. I love having captive audiences. <laughs> and it helps with lunch, right? <laughs> um, so um, I will jump right into it. Uh, I should just mention I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and I've sort of right now learned about the environmental biology also. Um, and so the, the topic that I'm talking about is meat. Uh, so I took this title, I don't know how many people here recognize this, where's the beef? How many people recognize it here in the room? Okay, so it's from a Wendy commercial in the past, uh, which was really about that the beef was bigger at Wendy's. But my question is also, where's the beef? And I'm looking at Brazilian media. So it's co media coverage of climate change. Okay. And, uh, and so I want to look at climate change knowledge and communication in Brazil. And I'm comparing it to, uh, against the US to some extent. So the questions that are motivating me are, should Brazil worry about meat production and consumption? Is it a problem there? Uh, and the second one is climate communication. Is Brazil a positive foil to the United States? And you'll understand why I'm asking that question. My argument is that Brazilians' health, water, and food security and sustainable development are at risk due to beef and feed production. But that there's a taboo or critical discussion of beef as a problem nationally and at various levels. There's a strong, and there's also a quite strong institutionalization of ideological filters and anti-environmentalism. But, as I'll show, this goes largely undetected and unrecognized also from how foreigners look at Brazil. So here, here's one example. Some of you, that's maybe not any sociologists here, but John Yuri is a big name in, so, in, in sociology. And this is an article that came out last year looking at media coverage of climate change in Brazil. And they conclude that Brazilians are most concerned about issues of climate change compared with more advanced societies. And this is true, I'll show some charts about that. And they say, attribute this value to Brazilian media, saying it has engendered and stabilized a high, striking level of climate change concern. And they say, you know, they use this, they say Brazil is in some ways ahead of most supposedly more modern societies in this respect. Okay? So those are very strong, positive statements about the case of Brazil. And the same point is in other, other literature, but by less prominent people. Here are some examples and quotes. Uh, Langman says, while Brazilians by and large respect the science and understand the conclusions of the IPCC, the US population is literally divided over the merits of the research. And there's, that there's a near absence of divergent opinions, which cultivates consensus, shared high level of concern, and political support for vigorous litigation policies. And other people will take this also to say that the media are actually showing the issue, uh, uh, approaching the climate issues from a pedagogical didactic framework that in order to make this complex policy issue more accessible to the majority of the population. And I have a very different view as you will, as you will see. I have looked uh, at the United States. I started out my research, as Denise was saying, and I was focused on the United States uh, science, climate science politics. So much like Naomi Augustus, I've interviewed many of these contrarian scientists in the US, and I've written about that, and I've written about the difficulty for people to really know and understand the issue. 
uh, in this article here, I, I show how difficult it is because there's so much, um, uh, you know, we know about the anti-environmental uh, backlash in the United States, how they, they you know, have these public relations campaigns that, so it's really hard for the regular citizens to know what the truth is. You know, where do you go for the truth? It's, it's very, very difficult. Um, of course, we have the IBC, we can talk about that, but then when something like climate change, ha uh, climate gate happens, or anything that shows that there's a less rosy side of science, then uh, Americans are especially very, you know, likely to be more, become more skeptical of the science. This is one of the surveys, and it's not the only one, actually for several decades now, in international surveys, Brazilians come out on the top when it comes to worrying about climate warming, the global warming as a serious problem. You see here Brazil is 90% of Brazilians expressing that against 44% in the United States. Also when it comes to the second column, whether we should protect the environment even if it slows growth and cost uh, jobs. And there Brazil is also about 80%, uh, very high in the charts. And this goes back to other surveys as well. And the same, there have been other kinds of studies. This is by James Painter, who's a, he, he's a journalist with the BBC and also a scholar in his own right at Oxford. And he came out with this report, he has other articles, uh, the charts on an article of his, but he does make a, a comparison also of various countries looking at the number of articles in, in the media, national media, newspapers specifically, that contain skeptical voices as a percentage of the total number of articles covering climate change from you know, various periods. And he concludes really that you know, climate skepticism is largely a US phenomena and it's especially almost absent in developing countries. And in these comparisons, Brazil come out with the least level of skeptical voices in the media. So, I'm going to show you, you know, another picture, but before I do that, I kind of want to just deal with this question of, is meat consumption a problem for Brazil? You know, often there's this voice in the back saying, but wait, you know, it's a, it's a less developed country or emerging economy with great inequality, where large segments of the population um, may need meat for nutritional purposes. So, um, well, I'll, I'll actually should do forward here. But, um, I'll jump to that issue specifically right away. This is a, an article from 2013 with the title Excessive Meat Consumption in Brazil Diet Quality and Environmental Impacts. And it finds that actually the population in Sao Paulo consumes more meat. So these are, these are kilograms, grams, right? Uh, in Sao Paulo versus the United States, Spain, UK, Ireland, where Sao Paulo comes out on top. Also, so for men, they consume about uh, double, I uh, know three times actually the, the maximum intake limit by according to the World Cancer Research Institute. And you can see 81% 80, of Brazilian men and 58% of women consume more meat than recommended by the Brazilian Healthy Eating Index, which actually is higher than the US. So in, in Brazil, it's 200 grams per week in the US, for the recommended is 500. So going back a little bit to this one, which is understanding also, to really understand more um, meat in the media in Brazil, you have to know a little bit about the Brazilian emissions profile, where the majority of emissions come from deforestation, which is highly linked to, uh, to cattle and soy also. So, you know, they usually uh, what do they do? calculate separately, but when you look at the IPCC, look at the, look at the numbers, um, so globally, I think it's about 15% is the estimate right now that the emissions come from livestock. Uh, and but, you know, some some people argue that it's more like woodland and major climate change. So it might be up to 50%, depending on how you calculate it. In Brazil, there's been a study that came out in 2013, I think, 2012. Sorry, but it was already released in, to the public in 2009, which is that in Brazil, about 50% of the emissions can be tied to meat. And that's excluding the transportation dimension, so it's actually you know, more according to the study, which is from by scientists who are in my center, including. And the important thing to know also is how Brazil has increased exportation over the last years. I mean, like you know, 600 times what it was you know, a decade or two ago. So you know, it's a very, very strong, important part of the, the economy, the exports. Uh, provide about 25% of the gross national product. So it's a very valued in, in, at, at that level and stressed, um, and that's what's stressed also in the view. But then also, is there a problem? If you look at, there's very uh, an emphasis on Brazil as this miracle 
uh, because it's been able to actually reduce its national emissions while it's really ramped up the beef production. So at the environmental level, is there a problem for Brazil in the beef production? According to The Economist, as an article in 2010, Brazil has more spare farmland than any other country. The, the if, if they owe, puts its total potential arable land at over 400 million hectares, and only 50 million is being used. So this notion, it's there for the taking, and it will have no consequences, because Brazil has done it, the, the, the meat, meat production, uh, increase without deforesting the Amazon. Okay. So it looks like a win-win, you know, what's the problem? This same message coming out here, an article by Daniel Nepstad, slowing Amazon deforestation through public policy and interventions in beef and soy supply chains. And there have been some important uh, certification scheme put in, and I can talk more about that. But that also circulated in the media, as you can see on the right here, Brazil leads the world in reducing carbon emissions, and it really has greatly reduced them, as I said. And success comes as soy and beef production has increased. And then this is from the National Geographic article saying, Brazil's success in slowing rainforest destruction has resulted in enormous reductions in carbon emissions and shows that it's possible to zealously promote sustainability while still growing the economy. So here we have the emissions profile. And you can see, if you look, the, the yellow is agriculture livestock and the green is land use change. So we put those together because they're very closely coupled in Brazil. The, the, you know, because the, the, the beef production drives and the soy production expands and, and, and drives deforestation. Um, so, you know, it's diminished significantly, for sure. So, what have they done to have it drop almost 50%? Is it seems like it's from land use change. Right. So, is this an annual emission that you're showing here? All the greenhouse gases put together? Mm -hmm. Right. The profile source of this. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right, okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So it's from burning the forest? It's a, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, the overall, it's the overall emissions that have gone down to that extent. So Brazil is like this, oh, yeah, it's very impressive. And there's, you know, Brazil is like, you know, yeah, it's leading the world in that sense. So it's got this, you know, no, and for good reason, it's really, you know, but I will also suggest, you know, that we don't exactly know all of the, all of the, the emissions. You know, there's, and that is one of the, Point of my, of my talk, but one first I also just want to mention that sometimes we look at the we look not sometimes I think there's a tendency to really look, look very much at the carbon dimension and not sustainability more broadly in terms of water at least what we know from this recent study of um, of aquifers that was done uh, that Brazil's major aquifer is one of the ones that are in a state of depletion at this point the, the Guarani aquifer. And that is very much, you know, 83% of the water used in Brazil goes to, goes for, it, it's not household, right, it's, it's, it's for agriculture. So this is an article that's coming out in Environment Maxing in November, December, where I'm really putting together um, a lot of facts about the Savannah region in Brazil, which is where the expansion has actually been going on. And what I argue here, and this is with Mercedes Mustamange, who's one of the experts on uh, emissions and ecology in Brazil and on the Sahara region, the Savannah region, is that we're actually, the, the damage, the, the expansion, the agriculture, this is where the frontier is now, the agricultural frontier in Brazil is in the Sahara. And that the damaging changes, the deforestation is going on there, changes, uh, uh, threatens life supporting natural resources and ecosystem services, which are vital for the majority of Brazilians, as well as the continued viability of agriculture. And so some of these facts are captured in this little fact sheet here put together. So the Sahara is considered, considered a biodiversity hotspot, which means that it has a very high, one of the highest levels in the world of biodiversity, um, and is also very threatened. Okay? Its total area is 2 million square kilometers. Deforestation in the Sahara and not in the Amazon is what it has helped Brazil become an agricultural power. So it gets most of its cotton, almost all of its cotton, 54% uh, of its soybean, 55% of its beef is produced in the Sahara. 60% of the pastures in the Sahara are degraded, and the biome is 50% deforested. At, at times it's been over half the size of Belgium deforested per year, recently it's gone down so it's just below half the size of Belgium per year. There's been, and this is what everyone talks about, deforestation. So these articles that I showed, they say oh, deforestation has gone down. They're not looking at the Sahara. 
the government does not have a monitoring system, and it has an extremely monitoring, uh, sophisticated monitoring si uh, system in, in, state, in, in place for, in the Amazon, and not in the Sahara. And this is something that's not generally recognized. Um, and so it means, how do we know what we know? We don't know. They also don't have a mapping of rural property rights, so it's very, you know, it's very difficult to know. Also, physically, when you look at the remote sensing, what is savanna and what is agriculture. So there's a technical dimension as well. But what all of this means is that it's light in the dark. It's something we don't talk about. And at the levels of discourse, there's also a technical distinction being made in government. Uh, between deforestation and in savanna, they say it's not deforestation, they call it suppressed vegetation, suppression of vegetation. So they can actually give much you know, more you know, positive numbers for deforestation, and no one really recognizes that this leaves out a lot that we don't know about what's going on in where the major agricultural frontier of Brazil is currently going on. So actually, what are the numbers from there? We don't know because it's so it's it's, it's not known very well, we don't understand the biome very well. A really important aspect is that this is a, a biome that's older than the Amazon and is highly adapted to the savanna conditions. And that means that the current vegetation and plants has taken, they take 500 years to grow their roots up to 25 to 30 meters down into the ground so that they reach their aquifers where they draw their water, but they also replenish it. So that means when you take away the native vegetation, you are you know, inviting soil erosion, but you're also taking away the key, a key means of re, re, uh, you know, putting, putting water back into the aquifers. This is stuff I've been putting together, using the so it's in the article that's coming out, but this is not general knowledge in Brazil. So there's a very, so in a very real sense, the biodiversity in the Sahara is responsible for, also for water security in Brazil, and in that sense also for food security uh, because of the water in long term. Okay? Um, so, um, so water and food, and so when you take it away, you no longer have the roots. Soil has very shallow roots and does not perform that same service, of course, right? Um, so, and yet, it's a it's a biome that's very little uh, protected legally. So, uh, you have uh, still four hundred uh, thousand square kilometers of pristine lands available for development. And more concerning right now is that the current government is it has a, is right now pushing through uh, through Congress a, a, a bill that would open up the sale of land to foreigners, which is not to say that the national owners will necessarily use it more you know more sustainably, but certainly you know, there will be even more land speculation. And the speculation is exactly like this, and this is you know very open that where you earn where you get the biggest um, bang for your buck is when you take away the pristine uh, vegetation and convert it to productive land, okay? And so this is about to happen. This is like, you know, land grabbing is already there, you know, more informally, with front groups being Brazilians and foreigners behind, but now there will be possibly soon, you know, a move to where it's, it's, it's open for taking. So the threats to water and food security, because why? The, 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 this, this is also not generally known, but we all focus on the Amazon. You know, everyone is worried about the Amazon. 80% of the water in the Amazon is actually dependent on the water that comes from the Cerrado. About half of the water in the most populated southeastern and south, you know, southern parts of Brazil are also dependent on the water from there. So if we really go away, you know, you know, do what legally can be done, uh, and where you have no real awareness even of the dangers, and very, very few pockets of awareness, then what can this mean? This can mean very, very serious uh, consequences for the country's long-term, or even medium-term, uh, or even maybe short-term, uh, water and food security. Right now, the Brasilia uh, capital is in the middle of the savanna, and they are having a, one of the biggest uh, water shortages right, right now that they've experienced. So, they're down to like 20% of the Indian water reservoirs. So this is what's going on, except you know, the, the vegetation doesn't look like forests, so you know, there's a tendency to just think, oh, it's not as important. But it's often referred to as an inverted forest because the root system is so intense, so extensive, and it's been insufficiently studied from a scientific angle. But this is you know, what I already told you about, so this is one of the experts. So we talk about the water and the plants and the importance for sustainability of the water. And he's saying the Sahara is already extinct, 
and this will bring an end to the rivers and to the rest of the water reservoirs. I mean, he's saying it's already happened precisely because once you take away the, 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 the vegetation, you cannot just rebuild up that, that system of roots that uh, is vital, the biodiversity of the whole, whole space. And also climate regulation is important, um, ecosystem service by the, by the, the, the biome. So that's very scary <laughs> stuff that I'm you know, thinking a lot about. But in my work, what I've been working on for some years now is, is climate, so is coverage of climate change. And this is a study where we are at about 20 countries, so it keeps increasing, where we have used the same methodology to study climate politics and networks, uh, so like policy actor networks in different countries. And I'm not going to go into like the diagrams and the more quantitative dimensions here, um, but this is the data that got me started on how you know on, on what I'm looking at now. Um, so this came out because the first step in that whole that you know methodology is to look at media coverage. So I realized that lifestyle cultural issues were almost absent in media coverage in Brazil. And then I started looking, so I said, okay, so lifestyle, that's consumption. So then I did a search for all references to consumption, consume, et cetera, in, as you mentioned, sorry, the like, major newspapers in Brazil. So I took all the, used the Factiva database and took all the articles that mentioned climate change or three variants of the term, global warming, three variants of the term. And then I started looking at the coverage. So this, after realizing that culture hardly appears, so like lifestyle, how should you know, people deal with the challenge of climate change at the more individual level or you know, lifestyle level for the policy, so I, I look at the red line here, so the, the blue line are the total mention, uh, number of climate change mentioning articles in one of the most prominent newspapers, and the pattern is the same across the newspapers, I studied four. And so from 2007 to 2014, and you can see the, so the blue line is the total number of articles, the red line is the number of references to consumption, and then I started looking at what are the references. You know, so I saw water, food, meat, but meat almost did not appear. This is an example of the major newspaper, Bobo, in 2014. And so what did come out of that? So you see, so you look, breaking down the total references of consumption that were like 118, and sometimes one reference to consumption would have been multiple objects, so it doesn't sum up to 118, but it would be like generic, let it just say we need to reduce consumption patterns. 63 references were about energy, 33 about water, three about agriculture, one about meat. And here you can see that I mapped it on the, because ethanol is like a big issue and, and are seen as, you know, and, as an opportunity. So all the green colors here are related to alternative energy, biofuel, eth ethanol, uh, alcohol specific, and also renewable energy is the darker. And the other ones, the more brown colors, are meat, cattle, cow. So I have really a broad comb to get a sense of what is most being approached. And then after that, I've been doing more detailed uh, analysis of the content. So that was just a keyword search, right? So what I started seeing, this is just what I started out with. I took just you know, randomly years from different newspapers and looked at these, you know, how what would break down. And so I saw here in the case of Folio Sao Paulo, which is the top most read newspaper in 2007, uh, 2007 sorry, you have that actually looking at the references to meat, I see there were only three articles or three passages that were critical of meat in some sense. And then I would start to see that there was also a pattern of refuting those criticisms of meat. Okay? So the criticisms hardly appear when you already have like, you know, a, a defense against them. That's quite strong, as I'll show in the next slide. Well, as you can see in the case of, of the start of Sao Paulo, where, so yes, said five critical criticisms of meat somewhat, but if you really see, I was very, very generous in my interpretation of what that meant. You know, I'm not talking about generally about articles really committed, really focused on the issue, just really brief references, and I will give you some examples. So critical of me in the case of Sao Sao Paulo, almost 400 words, and then I saw refuting criticisms is, you know, is almost 4.6 times longer than actually the criticisms themselves. And, um, and the same thing you saw in, in global, you know, same pattern, you know, to some extent, except that in this case there was less refutation um, or not on that issue. Here's an example, but it's also and the, the nature of the discourse, is the, the, the rhetoric here. So here is in the case of Sao Paulo from 2012. So this is what I counted as one critical you know, article of meat consumption, which is really only this, what you can see in the underline. Dependence on meat as a, as a, protein, as a protein source is a problem. It requires, I really say, just it requires enormous physical resources. 
That is one of the things I would count. Okay, so you can see I was very generous in what I would count. Okay, and then you can see the kind of rhetoric that then would be one of the anti anti meat um, uh, discourses, which is you know about let you read it yourself. Uh, but it's it's, uh, it's it's a kind of rhetoric that's very similar to what we read uh, in the United in the United States around the climate issue. Very strong, very uh, you know flamboyant and very rejected uh, of of environmentalism. So greenism as fanatical spirituality, we have communism, and then talking about those who criticize meat as the certainty that meat eating is a sin, um, da, 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 and totally rejecting it. So I did a more fine-grained uh, analysis. I don't want to read all this, but just the ones in blue are the ones I would still count. These would just be passages in most of the cases of you know inside articles. So again, not for and I would discard not, not count something like you can see in the two you know, other examples. One of them is by in, a, if it is in an interview with an environmentalist where they just mention red meat is a rare item because fish is abundant. So it doesn't really go into the issue. I probably should not and really should not be counted. Okay. So with that, I did further analysis of the coverage in the different newspapers. Here's the Folio Sao Paulo and the Globe for, for nine years, both of them. And I've summed them up, so they're both in the blue line, articles with brief references of the sort that I've showed you. This is the total. It came out to a total of 37 over nine years in Brazil's major newspapers. And then I separated that from articles with substantive detail. And there you can see there was actually not a single article or passage about the topic from 2012 to 2014 in either of the newspapers. So we, you know, what, what this shows is a very strong ideological filter, now obviously against an issue um, that's very relevant to the country. Here I just, you know, so the trend, if you take it in terms of percentage to the total articles, so there's a trend line here that's carved. You know, here is a little more accentuation of it, but it doesn't reach one, or it reached at most one percent of the articles that mention climate change will somehow have something about meat or address meat as a as a problem. On the left here, I just did a search on Google Scholar for articles that have meat, carbon, and climate anywhere, just to illustrate how the science policy out of interface is really, or the science media, as to say, interface is, is, is out of sync, right? So you see a really strong increase in the, in the scholarly articles on the, on the issues and not in the media in Brazil. So then I looked specifically at the reference to meat where they talked about a solution. And I looked specifically at the ones that then would talk about eating less meat as a solution. Others would talk about certification schemes, etc. So those are filtered out right here. When it came to that, what you could see, I divided into foreigners and Brazilians. Over those nine years, in those two, main, uh, two major newspapers, there was not a single Brazilian that actually talked about less meat as a solution in any, you know, any article. Foreigners did it a little more, but you can still see, you know, it's quite little. Um, and often, interestingly, it would come out like in interviews. You would have, for example, an interview with Pachari, you know, as the chairman of the IPCC, in which, in the middle of the article, there would be he would bring up the issue of meat. So it means that the journalists were not actively going after someone who was a foreigner expert on the topic. It would usually come in as you know as part of something bigger, where the foreigners themselves would bring it in to the discussion. So here it's broken up a little bit. So there was. In terms of substantive articles, substantive detail speaking to meat, this is the one example that was a Brazilian talking to. But this is so. This is where Greenpeace uh, talked about, or they did develop a scheme or, or push for a develop for a scheme to track livestock products, uh, so that they would know that they were not tied to illegal deforestation. So, in other words, a lot of these discussions about certification, I actually not saying meat is bad. They just say buying meat that are from sources that have produced the meat on, by, on illegally used land, which is public lands that have been taken over you know, illegally, or we should not buy that. But it's not really saying we should not know that meat is a bigger problem, doesn't go into that as a, as a global problem. And then I just, uh, this is one case that I witnessed, so I was part of this study that I mentioned where they, they say 50% of Brazil's emissions are tied to meat did not play out in the media hardly at all either. This is from uh, an article that came out then, um, around that time where they announced it. So we had the article come out later, right? But they announced that in the meeting. I was there, it was right off before the COP15 uh, in 2009. And what came out in the media when they quoted the scientists, and I was there, I know that they said this about meat, okay? What came out in the media was other things that the scientists said, 
my colleagues in my center, where they say, you know, there's been an enormous reduction in emissions. So they, you know, and my, my current coordinator of my center is saying the reduction of deforestation should really be celebrated. Okay? So there was a filter there at some level that I personally can testify to because I was there. But there's also another thing that's interesting, and I can't go into detail, but um, that the people, and so I know very best friends, these the authors of the study, and I know they quite suffered after this, that they were, they were criticized, uh, they were challenged a lot, but it was being communicated this message that meat production is really important to Brazil. So there's a method, this kind of disciplining of scientists, by right? disciplining that there, there are certain topics that you should you know, approach. So it really kind of just exists, but was not, has not been sustained. Even the scientists themselves don't talk about this unless they're, well, you know, uh, it, it's really not meat that's driving, there's land speculation, which is true also, right? But there's a certain of retreat and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, and so that's what's reflected also in where the Brazilian scientists are not prominent voices in the media. Okay. So that's, I think there's a dimension of things we don't talk much, as much about. I was trained in the anthropology of science, where I look at science as also a social process that's very much part of society, and here is what I see is an instance of that. So just to point out, so this is for all of the solutions mentioned, less meat certification technology, or no indication. So the first ones are the brief references over the, the, those nine years in both newspapers. And so you can see the breakdown of statements of passengers that, that, that you know, talk about these different these different solutions. So the most prominent is actually certification, where as I said, it doesn't really say you should, you know, it doesn't get into the sustainability dimension of, of meat outside of the it should not come from illegal deforestation. So um, jump to the next. So then I said, well, did I miss something? You know, did I miss something? Because I, in my search, I did not look for I looked for meat, cattle, cow in these articles where I got that I've looked at so far. And I said, what if I look up you know, agri, what we call livestock, you know, it's agri, uh, in Portuguese. And then I took the case of Global 2014, and actually what I found more than anything was two very strong editorial defenses of livestock. And you can see one of them on the, on the right side, which says, um, and this quote in green, if you can read, you know, where they're saying, you know, certain prophets of apocalypse issue catastrophic predictions without any scientific basis. Some of the hastiest of these environmental terrorists have attributed Brazil's climate problems to global warming and to livestock production in Brazil. And then I looked at also at one of the other newspapers, which is Estadão uh, Sao Paulo, also Sao Paulo, and, well, I just sorry, Globo is Rio de Janeiro, and Estadão is from, from Sao Paulo, and they talk about the supposedly negative effects of Brazilian livestock industry, so falling into question the science itself. <coughs> And the, the other boxes from the, the, the global article where they, they talk about the livestock sector as demonized, you know, and it's a victim of ideological prejudice, you know, as if it were impossible to reconcile agricultural and livestock activities with the preservation of culture. So it's a very strong ideological environment. These are editorials, which is very important. So this is where the, the newspapers actually align. And at the same time, also like in Sao Paulo, you'll have a, a regular editorial by strong defenders of that sector, of the livestock sector, and they will talk about environmental discourses as kind of a, you know, a plot by our foreigners. Here's the Amazon, is the focus of, it, of international greed and an obsession of the environmentalists who serve foreign NGOs, you know, but who most preserves nature and the environment are the farmers because they depend on it. You know, and then talk again about the importance of the sector for the, G, the, the gross domestic product. So that is the most common, you know, that, is, that is widely accepted. And this is a kind of attitude that you also see that in government. So you know, she represents the, 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 the quote I just uh, showed. It comes from the industry of the representative of the lobby of Brazil, and she's also in the government. But these are perceptions prevalent in the government of that sort, that environmentalism, for, and that environmentalism is a foreign plot. Okay, so this comes from an old report, but I have like a doctoral student now who is finding the same rhetoric now. So this is from a report from 2004 from the Ministry of Agriculture, Cattle Raising mm -hmm. and Supplies, where they say the more Brazilian ag business show high performance, projects itself on the world scene, the more foreign non-NGOs you know, and the international media of public reports linking growth in the sector, especially soaring cattle to deforestation in the Amazon. There are strong indications that this has the objective of farming, of harming the competitive image of Brazilian agribusiness. The inevitable suspicion is that it reflects the inconvenience that the growth of Brazilian agribusiness is causing its international competitors. 
this is a very strong filter. So you know, we can't. You know, so the science will be met the suspicion. And this is something I've mapped. I've mapped this in my previous work. I've done interviews with people who are like in the foreign ministry responsible for for climate policy, and that we'll talk about national scientists as brainwashed through the scientific training abroad. So these are very important perceptual filters, and they're the kind of thing that we rarely study, and you know they're extremely important because you can do all the quantitative studies you want, but if we if you realize that there are these perceptual filters, how to overcome them, you know, should also be a really strong focus of research. So right now, seeing you know, once one Brazilian voice against meat consumption, um, who's from the civil society world, and he knows Brazilians are not making the connection between deforestation and meat consumption, which is no surprise given what I've shown you. And this is just to, uh, to kind of flip through this, but very interesting. So right now, Brazil is going through a water crisis. What do they talk about? How individual households can reduce their water? You know, there's little, there's very little. I started seeing that we have a big drought in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo in 2013-14, the beginning of 14, and you know, where we got down to like the less than 10% of the of the, in the water reservoirs with really a major, major water crisis. And then well, this is what you would find, like, you know, there was a, um, advice to consumers of how they could, you know, what they can do, what can we do to reduce water consumption. And so they talk about, you know, how you wash your clothes, how you wash yourself, how you, you know, wash your food, um, and keeping, you know, no drops from the from the faucets, uh, being careful how you use the toilet, how you wash your you brush your teeth, etc. So it's all individual water <coughs> consumption, and that is less than 20, than ten percent of the total. There, you, that's when I would start to see there would just be some articles that would mention like the total water used to produce meat, but never it was that brought into a discussion. In no article in all that I've, that I've studied has there been an article really bringing this issue to Brazil and talking about what can be done. You know, should we worry about it? You know what can be done. What are the options? Okay, that is, that role has just not been filled by the media. that you go through. So one of the issues that's involved here uh, is ownership of the media. Okay, so we this is a report by Reporters Without Borders. They call Brazil the country of thirty Bolsonaros because it's even more exaggerated in terms of the concentration of ownership, um, where six, six families own seventy percent of the media outlets. And it's a very interesting system also where politicians, many of the politicians, so here one in three seats in the Senate, are held by media bosses, which is against the Constitution but not being enforced. So many of the politicians have actually made it into the national government by buying local media and then manipulating the media to get themselves into power. So that's some, and also many of these people are themselves come out of the land, large landholder elite. So you actually have a real, you know, all three in the same, three in one. So it's a very tight knit, you know, uh, uh, combination of interests in the same hands. <coughs> the agricultural lobby is the strongest force in government. Television licensing is used, so there's no transparency. The licenses are giving out without transparency. So look in the U.S. We know there's also been a great, you know, concentration of the media over time from, you know, what is this, '93. Until 2004, as a case in point, we know the Koch brothers that they've been supporting the denial of climate change. So, at some level, there's a great similarity between the two. Um, but there's also something more in Brazil, and this I've taken from the Global Climate Change Lobby, where they talk about that in Brazil there's something more going on. Okay, so the, the carbon intensive industries have contributed large, contribute large parts uh, to the political campaigns. They were also the ones that um, dictated much. Anyway, we'll go into that. I don't know so. But what they make the point that they make here is that there are no regulations for lobbying. Or even if there were, the thing is that lobby activities in Brazil are barely visible. They are because these interests are already favored by the country's political system. So polluting industries don't have to do open campaigning to influence public opinion and government decision making because they just don't need to. Right? They don't have to go out and do that because it's, the whole thing is ripped in their favor, much higher up. And you can say that that's the same what we see in the media. So the political interests are already filtering what comes out in the media. And this is an, an, an example about the debates. Uh, this is from under the compound project where we, t we track like the major debates in the in, in the national newspapers. And so these are the the, the ones ranked two, four, eight, nine, fourteen, sixteen in the from the U.S. team led by Dana Fisher put out. And so what you can see, what I put in red, is you can see it's, it revolves very much around energy issues, energy, okay, which is a reflection of the emissions profile of the U.S. Whereas in Brazil, you'll also get energy, again in the red, you can see that one, two, 
to 19 here, ethanol, biofuels, etc. And then I put in green the ones that are deforestation. But in these references, in the discourse, in the newspapers, they'll talk about deforestation. We need to reduce deforestation. But they will not bring it to the consumption dimensions of it and what to do about it. It's just like the government is somehow supposed to bring it way down. They're not looking at what are the deeper drivers behind it, which they do do when it comes to the transportation sector, where they will talk about cafe standards, etc. And yet, but the transportation in Brazil is 15%, or maybe, you know, the energy as a whole gone up to like 20% recently. So it's growing, but it's still very small compared to the others. When it comes to you know, something like this, this is not to talk about meat as a problem, but the prices of meat going up as a problem. And explicitly noting in this, this is like the equivalent of Time Magazine, that the sirloin, ste sirloin steak represents social upward mobility. So that's a real problem, right? There's a question of can Brazil freak, uh, frog, meat <coughs> frog at the level of diet and the prestige system that comes with it. Uh, but that's not brought up as an issue. Sometimes I see letters from the from the readers that show more more knowledge than than what you actually get in the journalism itself. But you know these are very individual voices. As a whole, Brazilians are not not aware. We don't have a civil society organization that's like dedicated to surveying this. So this is where you know there were, here we had PETA and. Um, going after Al Gore because he was talking about global warming and not being vegan, right? So you have that kind of policing. We don't have it in Brazil. We don't have NGOs. The NGOs in Brazil are most of all, all of them are receiving, most if not all of them, are now receiving funds from the major meat, from the meat industry in Brazil. So that's a big problem. Whereas previously they got more broad, now they get it more nationally. So they're in the hands of this too, and that will also limit what you get in terms of voices. So, to conclude, you know, the current academic evaluations of Brazil's media coverage and public attitudes are ethnocentric. Because what you have in Brazil is that it's not, we're not, they're not skeptical about the theory of global warming, is what we see in the US, but they're skeptical of the science related to meat. So where it hurts, the, the economic interest is where you get skepticism. And so we have to be aware that anti-environmentalism expresses itself in different ways. You know, and it's kind of, and, that, and I argue that it's climate communication is at least as problematic as in the United States, and it might be worse. Climate skepticism in Brazil has a national specific focus, agriculture has a problem. So in the U.S. and Brazil, there is information knowledge deficit of a sort of start, uh, which is something academics don't like to talk about. We like to value, you know, value the public opinion and participation, but there's a real question of like, how to, that we need to look more, what, are the, 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 what is the quality of the environment, uh, the communications environments that, that populations are working within, right? And um, if we need to address climate change, as a, you know, if addressing climate change as a goal, is a goal, then we should look at the democratization of institutions, not least the communications media, and that should be part of climate policy and research in a way that it's not. So we have, you know, like in the US, you have people like Bob McChesney who will say, He'll say, whatever your, your, whatever your first issue of concern is, your second should be media reform. Because without the second, you're probably not going to achieve your first. You know? And in the case that I've just been putting up for you here, I think that is, that is very true. And I like Joseph Stiglitz also, he's, he's, what he's still talking about now society. We have to learn how to learn and how to be a learning society. And I think that has to be a much more integral part of the research, you know, of the research agenda. So this is, you know, so civil society is key to progressive sh change, we know that, um, and to lead to quality of life, there's a faith in people, but we don't pay attention so much to, to the information environments. You know, what can we do at that level? And I put this book here as an example, which is a book, that's a great book, I really recommend it, looking at the science policy interface, but the editors in the end, and they, find, they made this observation that all of these, you know, experts were rec recognized uh, experts, they all assume, so participation is the solution, but we don't have that critical look at what are the information environment for people that have been as a central part of that research agenda. So, finish that. Thank you. Do we have a few minutes for questions? Um, so maybe I can ask the first one and then um, there will be others. So, you started out showing how Brazil's, as, as in, Concerned about climate change, it's at the top of the list in various countries. Mm -hmm. And um, you showed also how the emissions have been decreasing over time. Mm -hmm. So, how do you reconcile those two things with this anti environmentalism and um, uh, 
lack of concern about the agricultural component of mm -hmm. environmental impacts. Right. Well, one thing is that you know the, the deforestation business has been so uncontrolled and illogical, even economically, in many ways. I mean, it's been very. So there was a lot that you could reduce without really strong threat to the economy. And actually, the large-scale production, you know, in, in, in agriculture now, they have more green standards. They are able to to actually benefit from the changes in the, to, to the more green concern. So there is kind of like more efficiency, and this is the official rhetoric. I mean, they will the, the, the official rhetoric in, in, or you know, arguments from the technical knowledge is we can intensify. So that's that's what and that is what has happened. So there's an intensification, um, and there's a reduction of the most rampant. There really was new policies put in place by by Marina Silva under Marina Silva. You may know, um, but that has already happened. So now it's kind of resting on the floor. On the floor. Okay, so that has happened. And that has that has been very important. Okay, so that was a case where you had some people in government, and of course, environment minister. He was also someone who was not a professional politician in the same way. He had another constituency back in Rio, which is more environmental. So he did a lot when he was environment minister too. So these two environment ministers have been very important and managed these reductions. So definitely an accomplishment. But you know, okay, so it's been reduced, but it's still huge, right? That's the thing. You know, the emissions from Brazil still places it as fourth, fifth largest. You know, emitter in the world, so it still is really, really big. But another thing is that I want you know I think it's really important that we don't just look so much just on carbon. I think we've gotten to a point where we just you know we want to you know oh it's fine on carbon then everything's fine and then we're not really looking at like the water, water scarcity, water pollution, which is a major part of all of this with the pesticides that are being used rampantly without much you know without any much of, uh, oversight. Right. So Brazil uses pesticides that are not even you know, used in Europe, that are banned in Europe and in the US, etc. So it's really, you know, very uneducated people applying it in massive amounts. You know. So cancer rates have gone like triple, you know, in, in the state of Sao Paulo and certainly just because they're using this so much. And it's, you know, it looks like. So, you know, okay, it has done that. That's really important, you know, but there's so much more to think about other than that. Right? Where are you going? Okay, yes. So what, to what extent do you think there is hope that meat consumption will be reduced as public health becomes more of a concern, as people become richer and more worried? And do you have any idea to what extent mentioning meat with public health is still a taboo also in the media? Um, I mean, it is a taboo because I'm not picking up on it in the media. So, you know, but I mean, Okay, so you can say, okay, so I did my selection within, within uh, articles that talk about climate. Okay, so there can be some around that, and I think there probably would be some, but you know, I was part of the Chatham House. You may know that they've had some reports on that topic, and they really want to, to get at it around the, from the health angle in Brazil. But as a whole, people assume that we it's just such a strong cultural assumption. And, but the other thing is that you don't have, you know, so if you don't have policies that help with this, I think it's very difficult to change because, you know, I, I, my hope is that there would be a leapfrogging from it. I would love to see that, and I think there's potential for that. But you need to get the communications media under more, some kind of more control than the kind of interests that are currently behind it. So that's exactly why you need more, you know, in a sense, policy or more diversity in the media, at least. You know, there's not even a left. You know, media and uh, newspaper in Brazil. You know, they're all the same. Right? Look, all the newspapers, they're all the same. You know, they, they, there's no very little variation in the coverage in terms of the trends you know, on all the issues. Whereas, you know, under Compound, we're supposed to select three country, three newspapers with different orientations: one more liberal, one middle, and one more right. Can you do it? They're all basically quite to the right. So, you know, so how to manage that is a real question. You know, so can you come through if you don't? If you if you have such a filter in the media, how do you manage change? And when the biggest, when the, when the government is also, you know, majority is the, you know, the, 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 the agricultural lobby dominates more than 50% of the people in Congress. So how do you get things through that it goes against it? Okay. Yes. In terms of the link between social status and need, is that at all similar in other parts of South America, or is that really a Brazil specific thing? As far as you know, mm -hmm. you the, the, I'm, the, no, I'm not sure. I haven't studied other regions. Maybe someone else, you know, will know. You know, I just know, you know, in China, you know, how you, you know, you get chunks of meat that are like, you know, flatter. 
testing. So, you know, I think that it's probably the same. You know, there is this thing about, and there is a question about nutrition, right? So if people are not to, you know, get a deficit in nutrition from meat, and meat has been good to many Brazilians in that sense, right? The, the, the poor coming in and getting meat is good, you know? But there are other ways of getting it. But again, that's where you need policies to guide that, because it's not so obvious. You know, there are some things you have to know about nutrition to compensate that. If you're on the street in Brazil, you can get things with sugar, wheat, and, and, and meat. You know, even vegetables are hard to find. So the diet is really bad. Less than 20% of Brazilians are getting the daily intake of, the, you know, intake of uh, vegetables uh, and fruits currently. So you know, it, nutritionally, it's a very, very problematic place. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. You know, so the, Brazil, the government has come out with these guidelines, but they don't have studies that say how can we get to the point where people can actually follow the guidelines at all. They don't even know whether the stuff will be produced. And one of my doctoral students just done a study mapping. Okay, this is what the government recommends in terms of intake of, of vegetables and fruits. Do we have even what are the trends in production? And she saw there's a big disconnect between what the trends of land speculation, land conversion, etc., is not you know responding to those needs. You know, so although it exports a lot, and right now in Brazil we just have had you know, the price of beans went up, which is stable that maintains the health of, of poor people, has more, did more than double. Why? Because a lot of the soy and meat is more is more product is more lucrative. So there's been less emphasis on, on beans, which is a stable, and the prices have been really gone up. So, you know, so this is things that were projected, you know, I'm not, you know, but and we're seeing it happen now. Yes? In the green shirt, yes. So, uh, have you identified any demographic groups? Uh, in well, I mean, I guess the farmers are particularly uh, against this message, but in favor of uh, linking deforestation and back business and climate change? I think a lot of the population is really worried. You know, people are worried about the pesticides. People are worried wanting change. But unfortunately, at this point, it's kind of a dark moment, and you know, people don't know how to translate these more that these values into real life, right? And I think the Brazilians don't even, you know, since they're not helped to make these connections, they can be concerned about climate change, and they have no idea that they are eating meat and that's pretty. So how do you get about change in that? In right, that but do you see more reception, say, from the young versus the old? I don't know, uh, educated, uneducated, I don't know, some kind you know, of it's, I have not, I have not received it, you know, and it's really, it's an interesting point. In the, in the U.S., where people are environmentally concerned, then they often, you know, uh, produce meat, right? There's an, there's a, a way. In my institution, I work in the institution that does the monitoring of satellites. We know about meat in this whole equation, and no one around me is vegetarian. Okay. And I'm kind of like, the, oh, my hand is here, you know. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying everyone should, you know, be vegan. I'm just saying we need to reduce, right? So, you know, so that's the interesting. Brazilians don't have the same kind of tendency to translate even their values into, you know, what they care about into, you know, they don't, they don't walk the talk as much in that sense, right? Uh, which is, and that's a gross, you know, generalization. But I just, at least on this issue, I see that, you know, people. Are, but as well, you have to understand how important meat is. And if you don't eat meat, it's very difficult to eat interesting foods. We don't have lots of Thai restaurants and you know lots of ethnic foods with different flavors. I think it's much, really easy to be vegetarian here. In Brazil, if you don't mind eating salad and pretty bland food and rice and beans all the time, you're fine. Okay? Mm -hmm. But if you want interesting taste, it's very difficult to be vegetarian. So that's, again, where you need to get you know, either an influx of, of immigrants from other regions of the world, but it's very geographically quite isolated. So you have you're not even Mexican food. It's, it's, is strong in Brazil. So, you know, it's quite difficult to be vegetarian. It's really a sacrifice. You know? I don't know. Well, thanks for that interesting perspective. May I to hear that? This afternoon, I'm sure you'd welcome talking with um, people who would like to talk more about it. We did a few meetings later on, but we didn't have time. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank you.